I am going to talk about some things that get relatively advanced as well. My issue with Gradle often is that some of the fundamental concepts are not all that well documented. I mean, things that really do affect how you work with the tool are not necessarily obvious. And I want to spend a little time talking about that. So if you already have a fair amount of experience with Gradle, then you may find most of these things familiar. But I figured it doesn't hurt to hear it again as well. And I am going to try to stick with code-based stuff. I'm going to go to Gradle build files and not a lot of theoretical stuff. It's much more of a let's see what happens when you do this and that. And, talk about, uh, again, I, I agree with many of the speakers, I, I don't like the term best practices, not because, I mean, developers, we all understand what it means. <laughs> We're fine with it. But when a manager hears best practices, they focus on the word best, and it, it's a synonym for don't think. You know, <laughs> I like to say common practices. This is what you normally see, and then we tailor it to our environment. But rather than having to go through all that, I'll just say best practices to you, and you know what it is. So I, you know, I put it in the title because it's clickbait. You know, it helps get it accepted and all that. But hopefully, you understand what I mean. Okay, so I've got the top of the hour. Let me let me get started with a little bit of this stuff. Now, um, just. So you have it. Here's all my contact information. My name is Ken Cousin. It's Cousin like the relative, you know. Uh, my one-person company is called Cousin IT Incorporated, but my wife calls it Cousin It. Yeah. It was her idea. She said, that way people will spell it right. No. That way they'll pronounce it right. Nope. <laughs> but at any rate, there it is. So my email address is ken.cousin at cousinit.com. Uh, I have a home page, a blog, Twitter handle for the next whatever. I mean, I, it seems to be an exodus going on to Blue Sky, apparently. I don't have an invite yet. I am on Mastodon, however, so there's that link. And I publish a free weekly newsletter every Sunday called Tales from the Jar Side that's hosted on Substack. And I have a companion YouTube channel as well. Uh, the YouTube channel has a couple of great related videos, and there will be more over time. That's growing. Okay. Oh, one thing I should mention. I have books on Groovy and Kotlin and Java and Mikito. You know, all those technical books, I use Gradle for the builds on all of them. So in all the GitHub repositories associated with the technical books, they all use Gradle. The only one that uses the Kotlin DSL, however, is the Kotlin cookbook because I just felt guilty if I didn't use the Kotlin DSL in a Kotlin book, you know? Uh, that's something we should at least address, and I'll give you my opinion about it. Now, my association with Gradle, just to be upfront about this, I don't currently have an association with Gradle, the company, but for about five years, I used to, as a contractor, teach their uh, intro class every other month, you know, just to give people an introduction to Gradle from about 2017 until 2022 when they brought it in-house. And now they, they have a whole series of free classes, which I'm sure are very good. I just, you know, they're building up the curriculum over there. So that's my, and I did actually help originally build up their, what they call Gradle Guides, you know, the short mechanisms to show you how to do various things. But other than that, I'm just a user. Uh, one distinction I should draw right off the bat, this is gradle.org. There's also a Gradle.com, and this is important because for any open source project that's going to be successful, you have to know where the money comes from, right? If there's no money, then the pace of progress slows to a crawl. Somebody's got to sponsor somebody to work on it. Otherwise, it's just developers working on their own time, and that's kind of tough. Well, Gradle.com is the homepage for Gradle Incorporated. They actually were called Gradleware for many years, and they did something I always dislike, which is they renamed the company to match the name of the product. So when you talk about Gradle, you could mean the product or the company. Now, the way the money works is at Gradle.com, they have a product called Gradle Enterprise, which means I assume it runs on a Starship. But I forgot to open my instantrimshot.com. Anyway, uh, Gradle Enterprise is the commercial tool that they want to sell to companies. And it's got a lot of nice features to it. It really does. It's an excellent product. We're not really going to talk about that. Okay? So you're, the benefit to having this product, though, is that part of the reason that Gradle, as an organization, gives you free training and updates the docs and puts in all this extra advice is to make a bigger potential market for Gradle Enterprise, <laughs> okay? So the money is all coming from Gradle Enterprise, 
but we care about Gradle.org, the open source project, or what they often refer to as the Gradle build tool as opposed to Gradle Enterprise. But when you use the word Gradle, chances are we mean the build tool. Okay. Now, um, there's docs here, and the docs, sorry, let me magnify that. There are two sets of docs you use all the time, and then one you might use occasionally. There's the user manual, which we live on. There is the DSL guide, and over here, they, uh, they keep moving things around, but Gradle DSL and API, there's a Groovy DSL reference. That's the reference for the domain-specific language written in Groovy as opposed to the Kotlin DSL primer, if you will. Now, some of this is historical. Gradle tries to pretend this isn't true, but they were a Groovy-based project. They came out of the Groovy ecosystem. That's when I first were, was aware of them. And But the underlying code inside of Gradle, the actual Gradle implementation itself, is almost entirely Java. Now, they claimed it was for performance, which the reaction of the Groovy people is, if you say that, you're doing it wrong. You know, But nevertheless, the DSL, however, the domain-specific language for your build, is either implemented using Groovy or Kotlin. And the interesting feature about Gradle that makes it a little bit different, you don't have to install either Groovy or Kotlin to make Gradle run. You just need a JVM. You do need Java. And then Gro Gradle incorporates it, packs in, both a Groovy library and a Gradle, uh, a, pardon me, a Kotlin library, whose entire job is just to make the DSL run. See, Java is a terrible language for creating domain-specific languages. It's not a good language to write code that writes code. Whereas both Groovy and Kotlin have excellent capabilities for that, and that's why they process the DSL. Now, by the way, DSLs, if you're not familiar with DSLs, they're all around us. Uh, Music notation's a DSL. You know, it's a way of writing music down. Uh, scoring a baseball game <laughs> is a DSL. I would, a lot of people would argue that SQL is a DSL. It's not a pure programming language, despite what Oracle will try to tell you. It's a language for manipulating relational databases. That's the idea. Well, in Gradle, we have a domain-specific language for your builds. So the purpose of Gradle is to automate all the routine tasks that you always need to do on your build, which is to run the compiler, execute the test, prepare a test report, prepare an output artifact, whatever that might be. Usually it's a jar file. And then there are plugins to even deploy it or things like that if you want as well. Gradle is very much a plugin-based architecture. So there are, Gradle itself comes with uh, about 15 to 20 at the most plugins, but there's a huge plugin ecosystem at plugins.gradle.com or .org. Just a sec, I gotta remember that one. Plugins.gradle.org, which is terrible to browse, but good to search. Yeah, let me magnify that. And you can see there's a list of just, this is done basically um, in chronological order, reverse chronological order, most recent to latest. So it's really hard to browse it, but it's really easy to search it. Now the plugins, by the way, are not hosted here. They are registered here. And then there's a, generally a link, like if I go to, let's see, what would be a decent plugin? Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of the one from, uh, wow, I'm blanking on a plugin. Well, let's just look at AWS, for example. Um, so each plugin is here. If I went to just say this one, for example, and actually, I like to go to something more recent. Oh, Spring Native, AWS Lambda. That looks promising. Then the way these all work is that they show you in the DSL how to add the plugin, and this plugins block is the traditional way now. This is the older style that's used, that's required if the plugin is not registered here. See, if it's a private plugin to your own company, for example, you would use the build script block and say where it's hosted, you know, where to find it and everything, and then apply it. But this is for plugins that are registered at plugins.gradle.org again. And there's always a link as well to where you can get extra documentation. Here the link looks to be to a GitHub repository. And some of them are well documented and some of them are not. Now there's almost no quality control here, okay, just so you know. So you have to 
make a judgment. I usually look and see, for example, when I just did the search, I look to see how recently have they updated it. Are we on a, I mean, a 0 0.1, that makes me nervous, you know, it, that kind of level. Sometimes you can identify who made it. For example, by the way, one group of plugins you always care about is uh, Nebula. Okay, there is the word Nebula is associated with Netflix, and Netflix is a huge Gradle user. I mean, they do thousands, maybe tens of thousands of builds a day, and they tend to make their own plugins and then give them away to the public. So anything with the word Nebula in it is generally high quality. It just it may be specific to what they wanted to do. It may, may or may not satisfy your needs, but at least you know that there's somebody decent behind it in that case. Okay, so I didn't mean to get on the plugin stuff now, but just interesting, and you can add these one by one into your project. Now, Gradle, as I mentioned, is a DSL. It's a domain-specific language for your build, and originally the DSL was only in Groovy, and then they formed a partnership with JetBrains. Now, JetBrains, of course, is the company not only behind the IDEs like IntelliJ, they also are the company behind the Kotlin programming language. So they decided to help the uh, user experience. Now, this is Okay, now we enter the uh, opinionated area. I'm going to give you my own opinion. This is not official by the Gradle people or anything like that. Gradle versus Maven, for example. Okay, now I should point out that on the Gradle homepage, actually let me just go back to gradle.org, underneath the About section is a whole page on Maven versus Gradle. But let me just give you the idea. Gradle is much, much faster than Maven on small, medium, and large projects, and this page has the data to back it up. I mean, they actually show you a lot of the build times and everything. They have, if, if all you care about is raw speed for your build, then there's no comparison. Gradle is miles ahead of Maven. However, it turns out, much to, I think, Gradle's surprise, that's not what makes the decision as to which build tool to use in most companies. In most companies, it's who got there first. We're a Maven shop. We're just sticking with Maven. And it's more of the fact that Gradle is extremely flexible, very easy to configure, lots of changes you can make. And this is, uh, you ever hear that phrase that your greatest strength is also your biggest weakness? This is the problem with Gradle. There's generally half a dozen different ways to do everything, and most people look at it and go, well, which one should I choose? And the answer is whichever one you want. And the paradox of choice means people faced with too many choices just go, I don't want to think that hard. I have no idea. Let me go back to Maven. I mean, I know it ties my hands and I have to do everything exactly the way Maven wants to do, but then again, every build I have is identical. You know, <laughs> They're all the same. What drives you crazy or what drives most people crazy about Maven is it is extremely opinionated. You have to do things the way Maven wants you to do them unless you get really good at writing Maven plugins. But is that a bug or is it a feature? Again, it depends on your perspective. So in terms of speed, it's all about Gradle. In terms of standards and flexibility, Gradle is way ahead in flexibility, but that may not be what you want. You know, but this is what drives developers crazy is it's just too many choices, but then with Maven they get frustrated they can't do what they want. Okay? This is, by the way, why I believe that Gradle made the partnership with JetBrains, with IntelliJ, because it turns out the biggest weakness of Gradle is the user experience, is the IDE integration, is that it just doesn't seem to do what I want, is that it's almost impossible to debug, and all, all these problems. And they thought, well, if we partner with an IDE manufacturer, we ought to be able to get good IDE support. Now, I got to tell you, the only IDE that does a decent job at all with IDE support is IntelliJ. Okay? The Eclipse plugin is not a disaster, but it's not great. It's not good. Now, VS Code has plugins that get better. They're not bad. Okay? But not as good as IntelliJ, but almost anything would be better than the Eclipse support. You know? Again, this is my opinion, but that's what I've seen people go through there. All right? So that, I think, was an attempt. Moving to the Kotlin DSL was an attempt to improve everybody's user experience so that they would be more interested in learning Gradle and therefore be a bigger target market for Gradle Enterprise. See? Now, again, this is all my opinion. I could be wrong. I've been wrong lots of times, but 
you know, don't tell them I said that, you know, but we'll keep it between us. We'll be all right. Okay, now how do you know whether they're using the Groovy DSL or the Kotlin DSL? The name of the build file is technically arbitrary. You can use any name you want, but if it ends in .kts, you're using the Kotlin DSL. If it doesn't end in KTS, you're using the Groovy DSL, and you can mix them on a project-by-project -project basis. Like if you have a multi-project build, you could have Groovy at the top level, Kotlin, and an inner project. It's pretty unusual to do it. Okay, I wouldn't recommend it, but it would work. It would not be a problem that way. All right. Uh, I'm going to stick with the Groovy DSL for part of this, but then I'll show you an example with a Kotlin DSL as well. The docs for the Kotlin DSL, in my opinion, are not as understandable. They're still a little unreadable. And the biggest issue people have with the Kotlin DSL, for your information, is performance. Okay, because the, again, you're going to Gradle for the speed, right? And the Kotlin DSL is much slower. Uh, on, as soon as you get past the Hello World type projects, okay? Now, Kotlin, of course, is the definitive programming language for Android. I mean, you really can't do Android in just Java anymore. You can, but nobody's going to respect it. You know, you, but interestingly enough, even now, Android projects use the Groovy DSL when they make a Kotlin build, I mean, a Gradle build file. That's changing in the next version of Android Studio. So within the next Two months, I guess. Whenever they decide to version it, they just versioned it, so I'm not sure when the next version will be. Then they're going to start using the Kotlin DSL by default. That will be a huge increase in the number of Kotlin-based Gradle builds in the marketplace. Right now, if you just look at open source projects, the ratio between Groovy DSLs and Kotlin DSLs, I'm guessing it's got to be 100 to 1 or more. I mean, you're going to find hundreds and hundreds of projects using the Groovy DSL and a small handful using the Kotlin one. But the ones that use the Kotlin one know what they're doing. Like JUnit has both. JUnit Jupyter, they have a Groovy DSL build and a Kotlin one. You can pick which one you want. All right, now, one of the fundamental things you have to understand about Gradle to make it work is what they call the life cycle. It's not exactly the same as with Maven. So the idea is, in any Gradle build, there are three, quote, phases. There's the initialization time, there's the configuration time, and then there's the execution time. Now, initialization time, that's easy. We know what's going on in initialization time. The goal of initialization, I think I have it here, is to determine which build files Gradle needs to process. Now, I only mention one, but in any multi-project build, then you have a series of subdirectories of your main project. Some of those are Gradle projects as well. Some of them are, may not be. And the advantage to having a multi-project build is you could share settings among them, and you could also make one sub-project depend on another. For example, it's very common to have a sub-project called shared or common and then have your RESTful web service depend on the shared one, or the website itself depend on the shared one, something like that. So very common, very easy to do. That happens a lot. So at any rate, during initialization, Gradle has to figure out which of the sub-projects are Gradle builds. That's in your settings.gradle file. Okay. Now, you don't have to have a settings.gradle file, but they're already deprecating it if you don't. They want you to have a settings.gradle file, and when I create a project, you'll see it. Also, there's a file that you can optionally add to your build called gradle.properties. This generally goes in the root of your project, and it's a normal Java properties file, key equals value, with multiple lines. You can set your own properties in there, plus there's a few Gradle-related processes, like whether you want the build cache on or other things like that, and memory and things like that. Uh, that's for that specific project. There's also a Gradle.properties file that you could put under your, quote, Gradle user home. Your Gradle user home is your root directory, whatever tilde maps to on your operating system, and then a .gradle folder underneath that. Okay? That's also where the generated wrapper is going to go, where the wrapper distribution goes. So at any rate, the result, the, the goal of the initialization phase is to read that properties file, figure out which build files they need to process, and they could even run any initialization tasks, but it's, it's not very common to have specific initialization tasks anymore. They do come up, but it's not that, 
not that often. Here's where life gets a little complicated. The distinction between configuration and execution. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, an ad hoc task, what they don't recommend you start with, but I'll do it anyway, just to show you what happens if I do it wrong. Okay, to show you what happens when I get the timing issue wrong. So at any rate, here is um, IntelliJ, but let me close this. I'll show you this project later. And I'm going to make a brand new one. So I'll say a new project, and let's make it a, uh, an empty, well, I'll say new project called uh, GIDS 2023. And let's put it in my temp folder under GIDS, and that'll be good enough. And you see the first thing I have to choose, well, um, is whether I'm using Maven or Gradle here. And they have a separate link down here as to whether I'm using the Groovy DSL or the Kotlin DSL. I'll stick with the Groovy one for the moment, and I'll just hit Create. And here we go. Uh, it's taking a moment. By the way, my one of my fun plugins is called Nyan Progress Bar. It replaces my progress bar with that little Nyan cat going back and forth, and I still find that entertaining, so, you know. Now, they, the normal structure is exactly what you're used to. We get source main Java, source test Java. I don't see a source main resources in this one, but there could be if you wanted. And, in fact, I've heard that described as, I mean, Maven is the one who established that structure, obviously, but because it works for both Gradle and Maven by default, I've heard that described as Graven which I thought was funny, but at any rate. Uh, so you see I started off with the Java plugin here. The group and the version are not really important to this particular build. I'm not making a library, so I don't really care. The repositories block, the dependencies block, that's part of the DSL, the domain-specific language. Now, in fact, let me show you something right off the bat about the DSL. Where the heck is this Maven Central method, right? I mean, you look inside this build file, the, the key observation that some people find very helpful is to recognize this is a programming language. This is, these are methods you are calling. We are configuring, I mean, Gradle is an object-oriented system. The build file itself configures an instance of a class called project. In the Gradle DSL, there's org.gradle.api.project. And everything in here is configuring that project object. Project as a class has an attribute called tasks, plural, that is a collection of task instances, and task is an interface. So there's a whole bunch of different types of tasks, and whenever you add tasks to your build, it gets added to the project. And when you say to run, it executes the various tasks inside here. Now, Maven Central, okay, now this is the groovy DSL. Repositories is a method call. Now, you don't see any parentheses because in both Kotlin and Groovy, if the last argument to a method is a lambda, or in Groovy, they call it a closure. But either way, if the last argument is a lambda, you can put it after the parentheses. And since there are no other arguments to repositories, they, like, they drop the parentheses. So this is, in fact, invoking a method called repositories on the project object. And you can see it takes as an argument a closure, which they called a configure closure. In the Kotlin DSL, they would call that a lambda. But it's the same idea. So it still doesn't tell us where the Maven Central method is. However, now if you're a Groovy developer, you're probably familiar with the concept of a delegate of a closure. The idea of a delegate of a closure is, is it's the class that, that the um, compiler searches in order to resolve any properties it can't resolve locally. In other words, this Maven Central method is resolved as part of the delegate for this closure. Now, in the repositories method, here I'll show you if I mouse over Maven Central, the delegate is actually an instance of a class called repository handler. And that's where you'll find the Maven Central method and Maven local, which is looking in your own .m2 folder, and a whole bunch of other options. There's a whole series like even flat dirs, a directory of just jar files inside it. So that's how you resolve this. This is an argument that is resolved in the delegate. Now in the Kotlin DSL, they don't call it delegate. You have a lambda, and they call that the receiver. 
So it's it's what they call a DSL with receiver. It looks at the delegate, the, the receiver, and the receiver is, again, the repository handler. Same idea, just different language. And in fact, that's how you make DSLs. <laughs> you make DSLs by creating closures and assigning them to a delegate that's going to resolve the argument to the closure. In either Groovy or Kotlin, same basic idea. My friend Venkat Subramaniam, you know, has, has a book on everything. Has it, you know, see, we, we're on the same No Fluff Just Stuff tour together. And we have a saying on the No Fluff Just Stuff tour. You never compare yourself to Venkat Subramaniam on any scale whatsoever, except maybe height. Okay. Uh, Venkat's got a book fairly recently, last year, I think, on actually creating DSLs with Kotlin. So if it's a topic you happen to be interested in, he's got a very short, simple book there in case you're interested. Dependencies is also part of the DSL, and it has its, see, there's its method as well. And if I look inside here, now these are part of, I don't know if you can see it, dependency handler. See, again, they use that pattern. The delegated delegate is called Delegated delegate. Anyway, you get the idea. The delegate is called dependency handler. And these here are what they call configurations. Now, the concept of a configuration is, believe it or not, it's just a string. It doesn't mean anything without the plugins. The plugin determines what, a, what the individual configurations mean. Now, both of these are method calls. Again, Test implementation, parentheses, and it takes object dot dot dot, a var arg list of dependencies. Although most of the build files you look at don't use it as a dot dot dot, they instead just use it as um, with no parents at all, just with a single argument. And in Groovy, with a single argument, you normally leave out the parentheses. So here is a dependency on JUnit Jupyter. This one is using the platform method which is different. That's pretty new. Now, the platform method doesn't, I mean, I'm getting very little docs here, unfortunately. Actually, there's a reason. Let me show you a trick you can use sometimes to get better documentation inside your IDE. Now, when I make a new project, it creates under the Gradle folder, there's a wrapper folder, and under the wrapper folder is a file called gradle-wrapper.properties, okay? This is the file that is read by Gradle that will download Gradle for you, install it locally, and run it. But notice they're using the binary distribution and not the all distribution. The difference between the binary distribution and the all distribution is the all one comes with the sources and the documentation. So if I just change bin to all... And then my little grumpy Gradle fan pops up here, which is, you know, load the Gradle changes. This is synchronize the project with that change. Then if they're not already here, and I don't know why it takes time to do it, it'll download the sources. And now I can go back to my build file, which apparently I closed. And now suddenly I get all this extra documentation. See, because now IntelliJ is looking at the source code, and that's just the Java docs for the API, if you will. So again, this is platform. It says declares a dependency on a platform if the target coordinates represent multiple potential components. Uh, yeah, that's too complicated. What the platform is for is when you have a bill of materials. If you've got a bomb and JUnit provides a bomb bill of materials, then you just make the platform call, and this version number is for the bomb. See how this is JUnit bomb? And that's why you don't see a version number on the second one, on the individual elements. That bomb specifies the platform, the, uh, the version number for all of its internal components. Okay. Now, this is typical IntelliJ. Once I added the all, suddenly I'm getting warnings about you can't do this, you can't do that, and yes, I can. <laughs> and sometimes you don't get those warnings with a Kotlin DSL. You know what I mean? It, I don't actually have any errors here. It's just pretending there is. Now, this is actually not a good thing, believe it or not. And this leads into that, that life cycle issue I was telling you about. The plugin I'm using is the Java plugin. The Java plugin sets several configurations and a whole series of tasks associated with your build. Everything from compiling the Java code to processing resources to compiling the test to executing the test to creating the jar file all the way through. Okay? 
one of those tasks, each of those tasks is a class that implements the task interface. One of those tasks is a task of type test. Now that's why they're using a DSL here. You see, I know it's hard to read, I'll tell you what it says because it's hard to see from there. This is the test method that's returning, that's in the test task. And it takes a, a, a closure, a configuration here. The problem is that's eager configuration. And what I mean by that is you see this little method here called use JUnit platform, which is part of the test task? This is necessary if you're using JUnit 5. You do have to call that, otherwise Gradle won't see your JUnit 5 tests. But here's the thing, because we use that syntax, this method's going to get called, that task is going to get instantiated, configured on every single build, whether you run the test task or not. That's called eager configuration, and all eager tasks are configured before any are executed. See, now this is not a crisis. Normally, I want my test task, of course, but why am I configuring it if I don't call test? See what I mean? Here's how you make it lazy. Now, I'm going to comment out that line, and I'm going to put in tasks, which is the task property in pro project, dot, and then either register or actually in this case, because I know it already exists, there is a method called named. Yeah, all right. That way I can comment out this whole thing. I have a GitHub Copilot plugin which suggests code, and it's right enough that I keep it. Okay. Anyway, you see it says task.named test, then use the JUnit platform. And the difference is that's lazy. Lazy configuration. The idea is the named method says, ah, and here, let me show you how to fix another problem. IntelliJ immediately goes, I don't know what named is. I don't know how to do that. It doesn't know what the task is. When in fact, test, that should have a very, yeah, okay, that's the get task method on project. Here's the issue. In Kotlin, they use, quote, reified types. A reified type keeps the data, the class, and doesn't erase it at compile time. So there'd be angle brackets with, ta with, with um, test inside the angle brackets to say which type it is. In Groovy, they lost the type, and that's why IntelliJ doesn't know what we're talking about. So it turns out I could add a second argument of type task, or type, yeah, um, class, rather. And in Groovy, I could just say the name of the class. I don't have to write dot class on it. And now it should know uh, well, it does know at any rate that that's a test task, and that should resolve, yeah, all right, it's not, it, of course, it's not cooperating with me. But, oh, yeah, there it did. I just had to rebuild. And there we go. Now it knows what use J in a platform is. It knows what named is. It's got the closure. See what I mean? I had to give it the extra clue so it knew what the type was. And this happens a lot. Now, in the Colin DSL, again, it wouldn't have given me the same problem because it would put the reified type in there. And in most Groovy DSLs, it should be smart enough to know, but it didn't. And here's the other thing. If you're looking up the named method in, in the task API, how many arguments does it have here? How many arguments do you think we've got? Three. Three. The name, and it's a string, the class, and the closure at the end. And because the last argument's a closure, it goes outside the parens. And this works whether you're using the Groovy DSL or the Kotlin one. If I mouse over this now, it should see name takes a string and a class and an action, which is just a Gradle name for a closure, for the, for the block there, and throws unknown test exception, on and on and on. You use dot .named for existing tasks and dot .register for new ones, for ones that you make. If you just do this, now this is the old school uh, creating your own task. I'll say task, hello, and I'll put in my braces and go print line, uh, hello world, okay? All good here, and then let me synchronize, although I don't really need to. This is creating a task, but it's eager. This, and I did something really bad. I put my print line in here. This is going to occur at configuration time, not at run time. See, if I open a shell, let me just open a shell directly. 
move that up a little bit, and say dot Gradle W, I'm using the Gradle wrapper, hello, then it'll run it. So there's my hello world. But you see how it tries to warn you that I did it wrong? It says configure project. In other words, this is happening at the wrong time. If I say Gradle W tasks, just to find out what tasks are available, then I get this whole list of tasks. But above all that, look at that. It ran hello world. And I didn't mean for it to run hello world. I didn't ask for it to run hello world. But because of the way I wrote it, it's happening at configuration time and all tasks are configured before any are executed. The way I would fix this is one, I could go to that register method, but here's what you'll see in practice. Do last with braces. Let me put the other close brace on the other side here. Do last only occurs at execution time. Okay, delegates to the task, runs the closure, adds the given closure to the end of the task action list. The closure is passed to this task as a parameter. Now, if I go back to the terminal and run again, and I go up to the top of it, it didn't execute that hello task. It didn't run it there. So what I did is I said, yeah, okay, in, in fact, it's still instantiating the task but there's nothing for it to do at the moment. I actually have to call hello. So this is still not quite what I want. What I really want is what I was putting in before, which was task.register, quote, hello. And you can see I could, you know, there's the whole thing. There it is, and it knows it's a task, and I get the behavior I want. Now everything's lazy. So what you're going to see in the documentation is they're constantly going to be trying to make it so you don't do anything eagerly. You only do things lazily. In fact, remember, Gradle's biggest design point is how fast it is. There's two ways to get speed. One is to make the thing fast, and two is what they call task avoidance. Don't do the things that don't have to be done. See? So by making this lazy, or here, lazy, then it only builds, compiles, configures the task if you ask for it, okay? Now, one other quirky thing going on here. This task is of type test. I know that. There's an existing one. I, I, I know it's part of the Java plugin. What type is this one? See? Or if I put it as register. What, it doesn't make any difference. What's the data type? This is not helpful in IntelliJ. It's saying that it's uh, got... Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, now I have two tasks with the same name. So let me get rid of the eager one. There. It's showing me that it, the closure variable, if, again, in both Groovy and in Kotlin, if you only have a one argument closure and you don't give that argument a name, the name defaults to the word it. Meta comment about Kotlin, by the way. Kotlin often to me resembles a bit of a Frankenstein monster because you could see where it borrowed these features from Groovy and these features from Scala and these from like C Sharp and you can almost sometimes see the stitching where they went together. The closures in, in uh, the, this DSL here are pure Groovy. You know, but Kotlin does a lot of the same things, and it's kind of funny. Where, like in Kotlin, they use the word "it" for the for the one argument closure variable, even though Kotlin was created by developers who speak Russian rather than English. So why are they using it? You know what I mean? Any rate, uh, but the problem with this is, is that task is the interface. I still don't know the data type of the actual task being instantiated. Well, I do actually know the data type because. If you don't specify a type, the type defaults to default task. There is a class in the Gradle API called default task. And it basically has default implementations of all the methods. So far, so good. However, let me make my own task, what they call a custom task. I'm actually going to create it right in the build file. And then we'll see what this means. And that'll also help explain what do last is and do first is. Because the question that comes up in most people's mind is, do last or do first relative to what? I mean, why should I use do last or use do first? What am I ordering compared to? So I'm going to do this. Uh, let's see if I put it right in the middle of the class so I can keep it high enough on the screen that most people can see it. 
Okay, I'm going to say class uh, hello task. Uh, let's call it greeting actually. Greeting task extends default task. And I'm going to put in a method here. You know what? I'm going to accept that and then we'll talk about it. Now, I put in a method here called greet. Incidentally, in groovy, def means I don't know the type and I don't care. If you know it's void, just say void. You know what I mean? Make it easy for people to read, if you will. But at any rate, this is a greet method that's going to print hello from greeting task. And now I can make an instance of this. Like if I say um, tasks dot register hi quote of type greeting task, and I'll leave that one alone. Actually, I don't even need the braces for this. The special part is this guy. Now, first of all, notice the object-oriented nature of this. This is a class. This is an instance of the class. All the tasks you add are instances of a class of, in the Gradle API. This is a default task. This task action is what runs at execution time. So you have, I have a do last up here, and do last is relative to the task action. So if I use any built-in class of the Gradle API, like copy, or zip, or jar, or compile, you don't need a do first or a do last because the task action is the one that does all the work. If you need to pre-process before the task action, that's due first. If you want to post-process after, that's due last. Why does this one have a due last? Because the default task has no task action. That's the only class in the Gradle API that does not have a method annotated with task action. You make it a custom class by putting the annotation task action on a single method. Now you're allowed to put it on multiple methods and then there's questions of order and all that. I wouldn't do it. I'd try to avoid it if you can. If you look at a lot of the built-in ones in Gradle, they generally pick one method that drives everything. But this becomes the execution and therefore I don't need a do first or a do last. And if I go to my console and say uh, Gradle W hi, it prints out hello from greeting task. I know it's hard to say, so I'm hard to see, so I'm just telling you. Okay? It actually executed it. It instantiated this class and then executed the task action. That's what you need to know about the life cycle. That you know how to make tasks lazy, how to avoid doing things at configuration time that you don't mean to be running, and then what to do with this task action stuff. So the recommendation in Gradle is start with a DSL. Okay, the DSL is debugged, it's tested, it's run all the time. Chances are all you need to know is documentation and see how to use it. Then if that isn't enough, if you need to customize it, then you can make your own classes here. Well, you don't even need to go that far. Generally there's an API. Like over here, if I go to um, the user manual and I search on, say, let's look at the copy task. Then here is in the DSL reference, the class of type copy, and they have a little DSL, well, that's the DSL demonstration. Copy docs is an instance of task with type copy, so now we know what type it is. And these are methods from and into. Where are we going to copy from? Where are we going to copy into? Those are methods without parentheses because they only have a single argument. If that was in the Kotlin DSL, they'd have parentheses. Kotlin doesn't let you leave the parens out. In fact, some people like the Kotlin DSL because it's not as flexible as the groovy one. Again, it's that paradox of choice business. Okay, so these methods are in fact invoked at compile time. I mean, at configuration time. See, it's not just compile stuff; it's configuration. When this and the fact the way they wrote it. This is eager, so during Gradle's run, it will instantiate that task of type copy, call it copy docs, invoke the from method and the into method, but those are just setters anyway. They don't take any time here. The actual copying is in the task action. So that only happens if I invoke copy docs. If I don't invoke it, nothing gets copied. 
but we still call from and into, and in the documentation, those methods must happen at configuration time. The only thing I would do to change this, if I was going to use it in my own system, is instead of saying task copy docs, I'd say tasks, plural, dot register copy docs, comma, copy, and therefore this doesn't get configured unless I call it, unless I ask for it, okay? That's the biggest thing you need to know about the life cycle. And if you know that, you are ahead of so many people because it's amazing. You, and in fact, you may have an opportunity to be a hero in your organization. Go look at existing Gradle build files and see if anybody's doing things at configuration time that they meant to do at runtime. Say, oh, hey, let's, let's have it here. We could fix this and make it happen at runtime. And you save all this performance. You look like a hero. It's all good. You know, send me an email. I'd, be, I'd love to know. You know, <laughs> okay. So at configuration time, Gradle processes the build files, and it instantiates and configures all the tasks that it knows are ready there. All the tasks are configured before any are executed. Anything outside do first and do last, that's configuration time. So you don't have to say when is, uh, you know, which co lines of code are happening at configuration time. It's anything not in the do first or do last. And most tasks don't have a do first or do last. They have a task action, like that copy task we saw. That's the idea. Now, at execution time, they run the task action. I'm sorry, was somebody taking a picture? Did you need to see that again, or you got it? Whoever was taking a picture. Okay, you seem okay. All right, so again, this is relative to the task action. Uh, do first is pre-processing. Do last is post-processing. Again, relative to the task default task. Uh, and then here is the mechanism I say, rather than writing task my task, use task.register, named as if the task already exists. And the task, when I say, how do you know if it exists? It's in the documentation for the plugins you're using. The documentation for the Java plugin will tell you what tasks are available that it creates and, con and configures for you. Now, let me take a moment and go back to that build and let's deal with this issue. Because what you're going to see is the change from the Java plugin to the Java library plugin, which happened a few years ago and is making its way through the industry gradually. In the Java plugin, which was one of the original plugins in Gradle, they had four configurations. Compile, test compile, Runtime and test runtime. And that was it, basically. There were some internal ones, but they were rarely used. And the meaning, again, the meaning of these things has to do with the plugin. The argument is the dependency, the, the library dependency. Compile meant use this for the entire project at compile time, add it to the class path. Test compile meant just the source test Java hierarchy. So the JUnit one went there. And then runtime and test runtime were exactly what you think. Add it to the class path when you execute, and maybe just for tests. JDBC drivers were always done at runtime, for example, because you don't code to the driver, but you need it at runtime. The Java library plugin said, let's change that to test implement or implementation and test implementation, and we'll just change runtime to runtime only. In other words, they decide if we're going to make a change, let's update them all. Like now they have a compile only, for example. But here's the important part that's the only part you really need to know. When you have compile, you're going to change it to implementation in 90 some percent of cases. The other option is called API. And here's the difference. Say I'm writing a library that you're going to use. And you write a project and you depend on mine. Now, let's say my project depends on Google's JSON library. If I change versions of JSON, do you have to rebuild? See, that's an internal implementation detail of my library. I don't mean to expose it, but I did change versions. Do you have to rebuild because you're dependent on mine? Now, up until very recently, the default behavior of Gradle was always, yeah, rebuild, because they were very pessimistic about when things change. They always tried to rebuild all the time. But again, part of the way you get performance is by task avoidance. So they said, we're going to make, we're going to take compile and split it into implementation and API. And implementation means a private internal implementation detail. 
So if your dependency on mine is an implementation dependency, and my dependency on JSON is an implementation dependency, yeah, you don't need to rebuild. Because that JSON is not exposed to you. It's part of my internal implementation. You don't need to worry about it. But if I make it an API dependency, my implication is it's part of my, quote, public API, my public programming interface. And therefore, if I change it, you have to rebuild because it's exposed one way or another. So they took something that was, quote, leaked on the class path and made it rigorous. And that means that unless you are building a library, just change compile to implementation, change test compile to test implementation, and there is no test API. <laughs> you only need API. Now, sometimes you see API when you have that shared project. Oh, I'm building my REST API, and it depends on the shared, which is an API dependency, because that is part of what I'm building. It's exposed as well. But the vast majority of the time, it's going to be implementation. And sadly, this is not real well explained in the documentation. But it's there's nice figures and everything. If we had more time, I'd go dig into it. I just wanted to show you that. Okay? Uh, and again, the meaning is given to it by... Actually, I do have a moment to do that. Let me go to the search box here and go API versus implementation there. And let me just scroll down to the pictures. Oops. Uh, that's, I think I wound up in the wrong section. Oh, yeah, I wound up in that. Guess what Gradle thinks is a target-rich environment, you know? Uh, hey, Swift needs a build tool. We're going to get in on that. How do you tell the world that you've got a client that's Apple without telling people you have a client that's Apple, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're doing Swift now. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure you are. Uh, here, Java Library, this is what has it. The Java library plugin. And then here's the API versus implementation separation. Now, the thing is, they have a Java library plugin. And should you go from Java to plugin to Java library plugin? The, what's unique about the Java library plugin? It has the API configuration. So if you don't need the API configuration, just stick with Java and they're all fine. But if you need the API configuration, you can. And then here's where that picture is. Let me scroll, scroll. There. You see, there's API, there's implementation. The green ones are the ones they want you to use. And they rename runtime to runtime only just because it's clearer. They have a compile only, they have a compile only API, although I don't, I don't think I've seen it. And then on the tests, they have test implementation, test runtime only, test compile only. There is no test API one for some reason. Okay. That's all you really need to know about that. Okay, a couple of quick things here. You don't program in Gradle by having one task call another task. doesn't work like that. Instead, the tasks are arranged into a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. It's just a bunch of tasks on it. Now, it's a graph rather than a tree because you can have multiple parents and multiple children, okay? You can even have loops, but you can't have a cycle, <laughs> okay? If all the arrows are pointing in the same direction, you have a cycle. Gradle's really good about detecting that and failing right away. But you can have a loop because you can have multiple parents that have multiple parents. That's a graph. It's fine. The way you make one task depend on another task is generally using the method called depends on. Okay, you can make one task depend on another. That means if A depends on B, when I just ask for A, it'll run B first because A depends on B. Okay, that's the most common one. I would guess 90% of all dependencies are done through depends on. The opposite of depends on is finalized by. If A is finalized by B, that means if I ask for A, B will run after it. But if I, so I don't even have to ask for B in either case. It'll either run before or after. And by the way, both depends on and finalized by take like a var art list. So you just separate them by commas and it will try to run them in the order you specified within the constraints of how they are dependent on each other. You know, the intermediate ones are far less common, must run after and should run after, mean if I ask for both, it'll try to order them the way we set. Like if I say run A and uh, A must run after B, and I say run A and B, it'll reverse the order because I said A must run after B. But if I only say run A, it'll only run A. 
And should run after is pretty similar. There's some subtle differences. If you use either of them, again, please send me an email. I'd love to know what the use case was. In order to see what the order of the task is, there's a flag called dash dash dry dash run, the dry run flag. When you do a build with dash dash dry run, it'll tell you what tasks are going to run in what order. So you can see if you made it run where you want. Like I made my own task, for example, to create a sample database just for testing. And I said, oh, the normal test task in Java depends on my generate sample database task. So that whenever I tried to run a test, it would run the sample database. And I, inside, the, inside that task, I had an if exists. You know, to find out if, if I was doing a file-based database and it already exists, don't rerun it. That sort of thing. Um, Dash dash dry dash run will tell you the order. The shortcut for that is dash M, which I assume stands for mm, dry run. I got nothing. There, there's no M in dry run, right? <laughs> you know, I think that means mock or something, but I don't. Mm, dry run, that's what I always think. Okay, when you look at a project you've never seen before, when you check out a project from GitHub or you look at a project in your, in your organization, start with settings.gradle or settings.gradle.kts because that is processed at initialization time and it will identify which tasks, which subdirectories are also Gradle projects. That's how Gradle knows which projects to work with. So it specifies all of those. Also, that's what you can, when you can modify certain things that you can't modify later. Like the name of the, the build directory, for example. Once you're in config time, it's too late to do that, but you could change it in the settings file. Now, there's been a trend, and if you're an Android person, you've noticed this. There's been a trend to move things out of build.gradle and move them into settings.gradle, like arranging how to do dependency resolution. Where do we find our, our libraries? They don't even use a repositories block anymore. It's this big block of code. Again, it's all done for efficiency, to try to get that configured once, and then they can cache it and move on. But you could do it either way. Okay. Another thing you need to know about, especially with multi-project builds, is a property called ext. Now, ext either means extra or external or whatever. I've seen it defined as extra the most. When you're dealing with a Gradle build file, remember you're configuring an instance of the class called project. Ext is a map on the project class. In other words, it's a collection of keys and values. So when you say x dot property equals value, what you're doing is in Groovy speak adding a property to the x map, and the benefit to using x is that that property is then available throughout the entire multi-project build. This is a way you could pass information from the top level to all the children, or vice versa. Okay, so you use x to add every add, add, add additional information. And the beauty of it is this is the only way you could keep from conflicting with the existing properties. Like half the tasks in Gradle have a property called name. And I'm always trying to set a name property and banging up against either the project one or the task one. Just put it as an X property and, uh, and then you've, it's, you've gone around that. Okay, again, use the Gradle API. Gradle's written, in fact, I said there were three sets of documentation. I never told you what the third one was. The first one is the user manual, which tells you how to do things. That's the semantics. The second is the DSL reference, which is more the syntax. What, what exactly does this method take and what arguments does it require? What does it return, etc. The third one is there's a set of Java docs. Now, most of the time, you won't need the Java docs if you're just a Gradle user. The time you'll need the Java docs is if you start writing your own plugins. Because then you're getting into actually coding on the API. You'll get into the project class, the task interface, etc. So there are three. So use the type tasks as much as possible because they, again, are debugged and performant and all of that. This is the difference between an ad hoc task like I wrote it and the one at the bottom, which is typed. Both of those are eager. I didn't update that to say task.named or register or anything like that. And then creating a custom task, extend default task like I did or some other task, use a put in one method with a task action. It's actually legal to put in multiple, but try not to if you can avoid it. Uh, you can create the class. You saw how I put it right in build.gradle. That's because the Gradle API is already imported there. Later, you extract that into a special subdirectory called build source. 
Build source can have a source main Java, source main or source test Java, or source main Groovy, source main Kotlin, whatever you want. And then you can write your own tests and everything for your custom tasks. But build source is still recompiled on every execution. So the ultimate place things go is in a plugin. And we're, that's way beyond we have, what we have time for. But that's, that's the process that normally happens. Start with a build file just so you can get the thing working. Then you can get it out of the build file. See, the problem with putting it in the build file is it's not really reusable. You have to use the cap design. You ever heard of the cap design pattern? I maybe created it. It's called uh, copy and paste. The goal is to take an error of one part of your code, distribute it throughout the whole system. You know, or maybe that's just me. At any rate, so you start there and then move it around. Uh, that's the task action annotation. You saw it was it was in the API. Uh, ad hoc tasks have no defined task action. Yeah, okay, let me move on. Let me give you a couple of command line flags, and that's about all we'll have time for. Dash X is exclude. So if you want to skip the test task, dash X to skip it. It'll also skip anything that depends on that task as well, of course. Dash T watches your um, source code. So it runs and then seems to be sitting there waiting, but it's watching the file system. If you modify uh, the code, so either the tests or the source code, it'll detect the change and then update the build. It'll rebuild. There's a lag, so it's not great sometimes, but it does work. Uh, dash dash continue. Gradle builds fail on the first failure. They just stop. If you want to say, look, I know that failed, just keep going. Dash dash continue will keep going until you complete it. And I, that bailed me out of a couple problems. Things I couldn't get to because I had this documentation failure or whatever it was. You know, I told you about dry run. Now the dash dash parallel is designed specifically for sub-project builds, multi-project builds. It'll try to run these sub-projects in fork JVMs in parallel. There is a worker API that tries to do tasks in parallel Take a look at the docs on that. It's still pretty new. I'm not sure how good that is. Uh, we talked about the project dependencies. There, You may see J Center referred to. That's now deprecated and gone. Maven Central is very common. I talked to you about configurations. There's a constraints DSL that, again, we don't have time to look at, that talks about how to decide how to resolve uh, conflicts between dependencies. This one depended on that version of JSON. This one depended on that version of JSON. By default, Gradle will always pick the latest version. But you can override that. They have a DSL for it. Uh, use the dependencies task to see the dependencies. It'll give you a little graph and everything. And I think I'm going to skip the rest. Uh, there's build scans. That's what they want me to talk to you about. That presents a scan, all this information. It looks gorgeous. It's on a public website. It's on scans.gradle.com. And people say, can I get that inside the firewall, inside my organization? That's Gradle Enterprise. That's the hook to get you to go to Gradle Enterprise, okay? We could share the cache inside, all that. Okay, and there's loggers and ant and IDE support. Yeah, that's enough. Um, so I just wanted you to know about the lifecycle stuff, especially the, the way the DSL works, the custom tasks, and ad hoc and all that, and hopefully that'll get you a long way. Uh, let me put, leave this on my contact information, and I will hang out for a couple minutes, but thank you very much for coming.